Uh, hey, Creekside, good morning. I uh, hope you're all doing awesome. I'm Wes. I'm super duper excited to break into a brand new book. We've been planning on the book of James for months now. We took a little hiatus through the churches in Revelation 2, which was awesome. And uh, Shale told me, he said, by the way, just so you know, um, no, one's else, no one has ever done an intro into a book before other than me, so good luck. I'm like, cool, thanks for the, thanks for the pressure. Uh, but I actually did talk to him last night. Um, I, I actually, every time I preach, I do kind of spend a little few minutes with, with Shale each um, night before and just kind of, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I was glad I did. I'm going to tell you why in just a second. Um, but James is an amazing book. You know, this is a book that, as Shale said, it is blunt. It is to the point. It is very action-oriented, and it's a book people through the ages have wanted to rip out of the Bible. <laughs> and that's kind of wild. We're going to find out why. We're going to find out. We're going to see what appears to be, not today, but through the next few months, we're going to see what appears to be a whole bunch of conflict. People thinking, I don't understand how this whole faith, grace, works thing can all work together. It seems like what James is saying conflicts with what's what Paul is saying, what we're going to discover, though, there's actually deep harmony. So much harmony that if we didn't have the book of James, we'd have some real challenges in figuring out how to life out being a Christian. So it's awesome. I'm super excited about this book. I told my family I'm, I'm, we're jumping into this. And um, I come from, I'm married into a long line of, of pastors. Whoops. And um, they all were like, you got to see this. You got to see this. And my, my my, grand, my wife's granddad who's passed away has written several books on James, so I'm diving into those. I'm just really excited today. So before we jump in, let me just pray real quick for me, and we'll see what God has to say for us. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I just ask for one thing, that Holy Spirit, you would speak among us. You just hide me behind your word, that you would speak, challenge, encourage any way that you wish. It's your service, not mine. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I grew up as a, it, look, all things to me are sports ball when it comes to sports, but I did grow up a fan of baseball cards. I don't really watch much sports these days. I don't have time for it. It's just not super interesting to me. You know, maybe like a finals or playoffs, sure. But as a kid, I got big into baseball. As all kids in the late 80s were, as my kids call it, like back in the 1900s. Um, they're like, hey, I, I just thought it was super fun. Um, and, and I don't know if any of you collected baseball cards or not, but I just, I, I really enjoyed the journey of it. I enjoyed hunting for things. I enjoyed looking for them. I enjoyed all just the, the components of like just being a, a baseball trading kind of kid. And I looked up this week kind of trying to figure out where did baseball cards come from? Wouldn't you know, they, they were developed in about 19, I'm sorry, 18, this is a big difference, 1850. So just to put it in perspective, about one to two years before the Civil War. That's how old baseball cards are. The reason they became popular is two things happened in America simultaneously. The introduction of photography and its access to all people. And baseball became a prof professional sport. It became something that everyone loved, and everyone started to follow, and you'd listen on the radio. So no doubt, the two collide together, and we start taking pictures of baseball players. We print them on little small cards that can fit in your wallet, and now we have this whole trading world come to life called baseball cards. It really is what kicked off the whole thing. And baseball cards are pretty neat, right? I mean, as I mentioned, I, I was big into them. I think the reason I was big into baseball cards was I remember talking to my dad, and my dad would say, man, Wes, when I was growing up in Kansas City, I had a Babe Ruth card, I had a Mickey Mantle card, I had Jackie Robinson, I had all these, and I'm like, whoa, that's incredible. I didn't actually know who those people were, but I was like, it's got to be cool, right? Come to find out, trust me, they're really famous people. And he said, you know, when we moved from Kansas City to Ocala, he said we were super poor. All we could afford is what we could fit in the car. And so I had to get rid of all my baseball cards. I had room for my backpack of my clothes, and that's it. So he said, I threw them away. I'm like, wow. He's like, yeah, it's kind of crazy. I definitely had some money in all those. And I'm like, that's, I can't believe. So I remember growing up in the 80s being like, that's going to be me. I'm going to go and get some baseball cards, and they're going to be worth a lot of money one day. I'm going to hand them to my kids. And sure enough, what I didn't understand is every kid in the 80s was doing this. And so there's bajillions of 1980s baseball cards that are pretty much worthless, right? So I, I, this is kind of how life went for me. And I remember as a kid getting on my bicycle, driving up the hill in Michigan to the drugstore, walking in, looking at the shelf of baseball cards, and picking, like, I got 25 cents, so what am I going to buy? Am I going to buy, like, the tops or the, the, the upper deck or one of the other the cards? And so I'd always be tops. I'd grab it, and here's the reason I always got tops. When you open up, does anyone remember what was inside? 
a little stick of gum, yeah. So the nasty's like been there for years, and you peel it out, and it's like super stale. I'm like, I don't care. It's gum. I'm a kid. It's awesome, right? It's the only way I can afford gum. And so I remember opening them up and looking through, and my, my, all I knew was, like, who got the most home runs? Like, I, I didn't really understand. It's still all I know about baseball. And so I just remember just loving that era. But wouldn't you know it, 1952 was about the hallmark era of baseball cards. It was a time in which baseball cards had been produced for about 100 years, but there was just a time where it just became really, really popular. And there was a man named Mickey Mantle who was a very famous baseball player. And if you were a kid, you knew who Mickey Mantle was. You always wanted to have one of those cards. I never had one of those cards, never was going to get one of those cards, and still am not going to have one of those cards. But I remember this. And I remember um, when I, uh, every time I'd open a pack of cards, I knew I wasn't going to get Mickey Mantle, but I'd get somebody, maybe Jose Canseco or somebody like that. I was like really excited. And we, we would always do is we would open, I got a picture here of this magazine called Beckett. And anyone ever seen Beckett before? You can open that up and he can tell you what your cards are worth. You can kind of see what's the actual value. And as I was talking to Shale about this last night, wouldn't you know it, he brought his own 1989 copy of Beckett. So you were looking at a pristine, as only Shale can have, absolutely flawless, perfect mint condition Beckett 1989 uh, magazine. You can actually open this up and you can see all the values of cards. And so you know what I did in this thing was we flipped right over, Shale and I, early this morning, and we went and looked. I'm going to show this to you because it's right here. This, I know you can't see it, but this is Mickey Mantle's 1952 card. You know how much it's worth in 1989? $7,000. So that was like the holy grail. If you could find a 1952 Mickey Mantle baseball card, you're set, right? They're just super, super rare, even in those days. There's the card itself. And you know what's pretty interesting about that card is definitely it's old. Definitely it's, you know, it's, it's in great shape, all this kind of stuff. But I look at this one, and this is not just an average Mickey Mantle card. This is a Mickey Mantle card that sold last year for $12.5 million. Now, how on earth could it go, just a piece of cardboard, go for millions of dollars? Well, remember, in, the, in, in 1952, baseball cards were not as popular as they were when I was a kid. There were not a lot of those produced. And when he started playing, his, the beginning of his season was not very good. So no one really cared about his cards. Then he takes off later. At that area, I don't remember how you remember this, that, are, that may be a, a bit older than I am, but you probably had baseball cards, and you just stuck them in the back of your bike, and it, as you roll, go brrrr. That's like your only use for baseball cards. It's like, whoops, I wish I would have remembered that in the 50s. So that's why this card became so valuable. It's extremely rare, and Mickey Mantle just soared off into just being one of the most famous baseball players to have ever lived. Now, here's the thing. I can't just take any baseball card with Mickey Mantle on it and get $12.5 million. You see that 9.5 that's up there? In order for this card to sell last year for that much money, they had to take it in and take it to a company that grades cards, okay? This is, there's only two companies that do card grading. And what they do is they look at it, look at the edges and sharp and all these like defoil and all these different things I don't understand. And they come back with a rating. 9.5 is as high as you can get. So this came back perfection. Now, why do I say all of this? I say it because of this. The genuineness of something valuable must first be affirmed through a process of examination and testing. In other words, anything valuable in life, anything, has to be tested. I can't just come up and say, well, this is expensive, you should buy it. I have to prove that it's expensive. If I say this gold, this ring is, is gold, and I want to sell it to you, you want to know it's real gold. Now, let me ask you this question. What's the most important thing in a believer's life? I would say our eternal standing with God, our salvation. Wouldn't you? So that begs the question, does the Bible talk about testing our salvation. If I test a baseball card to see its worth, shouldn't I test my own life to see what it's worth, to see where it stands, to see how genuine it is? And wouldn't you know it, the Bible, Old Testament and New, has a lot to say about testing our faith. I give you, I've got two verses from you, uh, for you. One Old, one New Testament, but there's many more we could go with. First one, I got it up here, is Psalm 139, 23, 24. So this is David speaking. Look what David says. He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Let's time out on that for just a second. So here is King David 
praying a very dangerous prayer. He's saying, God, test me. Examine me. This idea of David saying to God, I know there's some, probably some dark areas in my heart that are not quite right. And I am welcoming you to come in and shine light. Every Christian needs to pray that prayer. I need to pray that prayer. And that is a dangerous prayer because God will answer it and God will shine light into some areas you may not have known or have wanted him to shine light into. But look what he goes on to say. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I love that David does not just walk in and say, hey, God, lead me everlasting. Let's go, buddy. I'm on it. Let's, let's, let's go. He knows in order to go on the way everlasting, he has to go through a journey first of God exposing these areas in his heart. And if you know anything about David, you know he was not quite a perfect man. He was guilty of murder. He was guilty of adultery. He also did some, he broke the law. He was challenged. And here's the thing that I love about David. He was open to coming to God saying, yes, I messed up bad. Putting his hands up in surrender and saying, expose me. It is true. I am guilty and I'm repenting and coming after you. See, the measure of David was not the perfection of the life he lived, but his willingness to repent in humility before God. And that's why when God looked at David, he said, that's a man after my own heart. That's how God can look at a murderer and an adulterer and say, that's a man after my own heart. I think we can learn a lot from that. What does the New Testament say? Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. So literally, give me an examination. Paul says that it's important for me to test myself to see where I stack up. He says this, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, with a caveat, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. That's a weighty, if I may say, scary passage. Because I think we all have a little bit of a fear and trepidation of what happens if I take the test and I fail. Add to that, how many times do we doubt? I doubt. I've doubted my salvation. I do doubt my salvation. Oftentimes I wonder, where do I actually stand? And then you come to this and Paul says, I'm glad you doubt. Let's test yourself. That's a scary thing. But you know what's worse is not testing yourself. Of just assuming that we're good. Just, I'm good to go. I don't need to worry about it. It's so good to test yourself. And that's what the Bible talks about over and over. If salvation is truly valuable, then we should test it and we should test it often. And here's the awesome thing that I want you to take encouragement from. Nobody in the Bible talks more about testing yourself than Jesus. He's the only person that never needed to test himself. And yet all he does is he talks often about testing yourself. What do I mean by that? If you go and look, we're not, we don't have time for this today. In fact, we're going to mention several verses today. You're just going to have to circle and go back to. Jesus entered into his ministry he was primarily dealing with two groups of people. One, just your average, everyday person. Someone that was looking for the Messiah, looking for change, looking for freedom from Rome, looking for a new prophet to come on the scene, but had no idea who Jesus was and what his actual ministry was going to look like. Then you have the other group of people, the religious leaders of the day. They looked awesome. They followed all the rules. Everyone looked up to them. Everyone was like, man, these people have it made, and they've got years of training, and on and on and on. And Jesus walks up to them and says, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. You guys are like dead inside, is what he would say. So Jesus enters into his ministry with these two people groups in mind. And what does he do? He preaches the most powerful sermon ever preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And if you've never seen it, go look at Matthew 5, 6, 7. I promise you it will change your life if you really jump in in depth. And here's why it's so powerful. Because when Jesus starts speaking, he does not speak the way that the elders in his day spoke. He turned the tables on literally everything. Let me give you examples. First thing he does is he walks up and he says, you know what? Outward religion does not matter. What is in your heart matters. What comes out of your heart is what matters. Not what goes into you. It's not about all these clean things that you have to do. It's what comes out of your heart that I care about. Then he shifts and turns the tables again on them. He says, you know, you've heard it say don't murder. And a bunch of you are like, yeah, pff, that's good. I've never murdered you. I've never stuck a knife in the back of anybody. So I'm good to go. Jesus says, here's the problem with that. If you've had anger with your brother, you're guilty of murder. Every single one of us, me at the forefront, has been guilty of murder in my heart. 
because I can be angry at my brother on the reg. And I'm sure you have too. So now Jesus levels the playing field that there is no one that's going to get out of this because Jesus attacks our hearts. He says, you got an anger problem in your heart. You're guilty of murder. And then he does the same thing with lust. He says, if you've looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. He's flipping the tables. Every one of us now stands before the throne of God saying, guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And then Jesus goes even further down. And now he starts talking about what does the kingdom of God value? What, is a, what does a kingdom person look like in my dominion? And he names people and he says people that are like this. People that are poor in spirit, not rich in spirit. People that are mourning and sad. Not all everything put together. He talks about people that are broken people that are pure in heart, people that are peacemakers with others. That's who he says is in my kingdom. So we look at all of this and we see that Jesus has completely flipped the table on all of us. And just like the Mickey Mantle card, if I'm going to grade myself and send it in, it's going to come back with a zero. Because I don't have it within myself to meet those standards. I don't have the ability to manufacture what Jesus commands for me in his new kingdom. And that's a huge problem for us is that I don't stack up. And neither do you. Neither does anybody. So when we come to the book of James, what you're going to notice when you read it fresh this week, and I encourage you to, you are going to see the book of James is pretty much just like the Sermon on the Mount. It's like some people have called it a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. It's so eerily close that James is taking what Jesus taught and making it just, just his own version of it. You're going to find it to be practical. You're going to find simple commands that are yet very difficult to follow. You're going to find him stepping on your toes spiritually. You can come to James over and over and over in your life, and I make, I'll make you this promise. If you come with humility, there is much that God has to teach you and teach me as we go through this book. So this is what James is all about. It's actually a wisdom book in the New Testament. It's very similar to Proverbs. Look at it through that lens the next time you look at it. Say, I want to look at this as a wisdom book. What would you have to teach me? So now with all of that in mind, we can now ask this question. Who is James? And let me tease this one for you. James has one of the most interesting, radical stories in all of the New Testament. How's that for you? James, short of the Apostle Paul, no one has gone through a more powerful testimony than James. And you know what I think is so cool? The Bible does just not outright just say it. You have to dig. So often in the Bible, Jesus invites us to dig. And when you dig, you discover treasures and truths. And so what I'm going to invite you to do with me today is we're going to look into the life of James. Because to understand the book of James, we need to understand the life of James. And to understand the life of James, we have to know what God has done in his life. And I promise you, it's powerful. So let's take a look. First of all, who is James not? That's probably the best way to start. There are four people mentioned in the New Testament that are all named James. James is a very common name. So there's a lot of Jameses running around, right? One of those that people thought for years is maybe James is... One of the apostles. There were actually two Jameses that were apostles of the 12. <laughs> there are two of them. So we looked at both of them. One is called James the Lesser. He's only really mentioned in reference to the other apostles. He's not really mentioned in, in, really, in, in the New Testament in any significant way. Now don't hear me say that makes him insignificant. He was, he was still significant. Just in the Bible, he was not really mentioned in a significant way. And sometimes that's, that's life, right? God's like, I'm having you do mighty things. No one knows about it. We're pretty sure it's not him. The other James that you might think is a good candidate is the other apostle who's the brother of John. If you remember them, Jesus called them the sons of thunder, James and John. They were fiery. They were passionate. They were way too overboard, and they're like zeal for things. But here's why we know it was not that apostle. He was actually the very first apostle martyred. Stephen was killed first as just a believer. The next Christian killed publicly was James. James was killed before this book was written, so we know it's not the Apostle James. There's one other James that's mentioned briefly who's another Apostle's dad. I think we can skip that one because we're pretty sure it's not him. So most commentators, most scholars believe that this James is the brother of Jesus. 
we might say he's the half-brother of Jesus. Because Mary was betrothed to Joseph, and we know the Christmas story. She was a virgin. She conceived with Jesus. Jesus was born. So Joseph was not really Jesus' earthly dad. I guess you could say a figurehead, right? But, but God was his dad, God the Father. But wouldn't you know it, Jesus has a lot of brothers and sisters. And I don't know about you. I don't think about this enough. What do you think it was like, Jesus growing up with brothers and sisters? Then I started asking myself, well, how many brothers and sisters does he have? I'm guessing just a couple, two, three, something like that, probably, you know. And I wonder what that's like. And they're probably all younger brothers because he was born first. And Mary had not conceived, or had, had, she was a virgin. So, like, I'm guessing they're all, like, younger brothers, right? That's kind of what I was thinking. So let's take a look real quick and kind of get a picture of what Jesus' life was like with his brothers and sisters. Because this is really going to help us see the story of what God's master plan is behind the scenes. Okay, So one of the places we can see this is in Mark chapter 6. If you look at these verses, I'm just going to read them real quick. You're going to see a picture of his family. He went away, meaning Jesus. He went away from where he was preaching. And he goes to his hometown. It's called Galilee. And his disciples followed with him. So his 12 disciples and very likely a train of other people are following him. So he's got a lot of people are following him around. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? So they see the effects of Jesus. They see what he's doing. They see how he's moving the needle in this area. They see that he is not like other people. He teaches in a different way. He heals people that no one's ever done before. This guy is definitely shaking up the world. They see that. But now look what they say next. Verse 3. Is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives in his own household. So first of all, that's a sad statement. Jesus, I, I'm telling you, if I come home, I want, I want people to roll out the red carpet. I want my family to be like, hey, it's so good to see you and give me hugs and hug my kids and hug my wife. Like that's what, when I come home, that's what I expect. Jesus got the opposite of that. He got doubt. He got, how can this be him? And then they mention his family. You see it? So he's got four brothers, and it says sisters. So Jesus, is he lives in a family of at least six siblings. That's kind of wild. Now, again, I sanctified imagination. I have no idea. Was he a year older than them? 20 years? I don't know. But he definitely lived with siblings. At least six of them, possibly more sisters, because it just says sisters. So here's Jesus in a whole family of people. And here's the thing. This is not the only time that Jesus interacts with his family. And at no time does Jesus have a good interaction with his siblings. That kind of hurts. Let's take a peek at this. Mark 3, if we back up a little bit, again, just circle this one. You can go to it later. But in Mark chapter 3, Jesus is in Galilee. He's working among his, or nearby, and he's working with his, he's doing his ministry. He's doing his awesome things. God is moving. Verse 20, and Jesus is out teaching, and his family literally comes in, verse 20 says, to seize him to grab him, to pull him out of there. They're looking at this like, what is this crazy guy doing? Trying to get him out of his ministry, get him out of what he's doing. Now, I have no idea why. Is it because they're worried that he's upsetting the apple cart and making a whole bunch of religious leaders mad and they think they might be implicated? Maybe, very likely. Is it because he's worried or they're worried? It, it just, like they've never seen Jesus do miracles like heavily like this before for the first 30 years, years of his life. He's relatively quiet. They just don't get it. Maybe. We don't know. But we do know they were trying to get him out of there. You go fast forward a few verses into verse 31 of Mark 3. The siblings come over and they're waiting outside. People come up like, yo, Jesus, your family's right over here. And they're ready to get you. And Jesus is like, what are you talking about? You guys are my family, not them. So Jesus is already helping us understand, like, what is the family of God? You look at John chapter 7, another one to circle. Jesus is interacting with his brothers. They're in Galilee, and his brothers come up to him, and they say, Hey, Jesus, the, 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 the Feast of Booths is coming up. Why don't you get out of here and go? You're not really welcome here. We would rather you go to Jerusalem and get out, because we're just not comfortable with you in Galilee. We don't really want you around. That's sad. Now, I, I, I don't know what that's like, 
But I sure will tell you this. I know what it's like to try to test out your faith. I remember I became a believer at 16. And let me tell you, it was awkward to start living out my faith in front of my family, <laughs> right? Because they've seen all my weaknesses. They've seen my hypocrisy. Let me tell you this. It's hard to live out my faith with my family right now because they see my hypocrisy. They see the errors of my ways. They see my sinfulness. And so I just want you to know, sometimes the blocker that we have in serving God is our own embarrassment and our own feeling of being a hypocrite. And let me just tell you this. You are a hypocrite. I am a hypocrite. If we're letting our fear of our family hold us from serving, just know Jesus went through that too. And Jesus is calling you. If you feel like you have got a calling, Michelle's up here and he's talking about, hey, we need more people to serve. That's your calling. That's what God is asking you to do. Don't let your family get in the way of that. Don't let other things get in the way. Just start serving him. That's what Jesus did. We don't really have an excuse. If Jesus did it in the face of his family denying him, what? we don't really have an excuse either. So now let's fast forward. Okay, so, so we have the picture that his family, I don't, wouldn't say they don't necessarily like him, but they are not comfortable with him. They don't like what he's, his ministry is all about. They want, to get, they want him to stop doing all of this. I mean, th this is not a great situation for Jesus, right? So that's where we're at. Now, what I want us to do is I want us to fast forward in Jesus' life. Fast forward just a few months, and now we see Jesus being executed. He's dying the, the, the criminal's death. If you want a good example of this, we, we venerate, you know, a cross, as I think we should. But back in those days, it was the equivalent of an electric chair. So here's Jesus at the spiritual electric chair. And what does it say when he's at the cross? Mary, his mother, is with him, as only a mother would do. A loving, caring mother. For sure she's there. There is no mention of his brothers and sisters. Pretty sure they were not there. And can you blame him? I mean, this whole time, they don't like what he's doing. They want nothing to do with him. They're denying him. So now he's dying, and the last thing they want to have happen is people look over and say, aren't you like his brother? Maybe we should throw you over here too. So they're probably super fearful of it. So they are nowhere around. So here is Jesus dying without even his family, short of his mother. Now, I don't want us to paint an overly strong picture of this. The real pain that Jesus went through is the denial of his father when sin was laid upon him. But it sure doesn't help to have your brothers and sisters not around either, right? So this is Jesus, and this is James. Nothing to do with Jesus. And here Jesus dies a sinner's death, buried. James is nowhere to be seen. So why do I say all of this? Because we're going to see James show up. And it's going to bring up this question. What in the world happened in James's life? to make his life get radically changed. So let's take a peek at it. Paul actually gives us a hint, actually gives us the answer. If you go over and look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 7, I'm going to read this, and you're going to see something interesting show up. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, meaning Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though so, some have fallen asleep. Now watch this right here. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Wow. There's our answer. James the denier. James who wants nothing to do with his brother. What does Jesus do? He takes action instead. After Jesus died, after Jesus was buried, after Jesus rises again, he then goes to his brother. See, James has a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And I just wonder what that was like for James. <laughs> Don't you? Like, we, we, it doesn't tell us. Did James just show up for five minutes? He's like, hey, you messed that one up, Buster. Why don't you start following me? I don't know. Did he, did he show up for hours? Did he show up for days? I tend to think that way. If you would let me use my imagination a little bit, here's what I think happens. Jesus shows up on the scene. Peter's trying to figure this out. Peter realizes everything he thought about his brother was completely wrong. Peter's probably terrified to see the resurrected half-brother in front of him. And what does Jesus do? He loves him. He runs up. He gives him a hug. They start weeping. Everything is reconciled. And I imagine that Jesus sits down with him and says, can we just re-explain life here? Can I tell you everything that I'm about? 
all the things you didn't understand, can I explain to you? That's what I imagine happened. James has a real encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and it changes his life. He goes from a denier to someone that starts to follow him. And I want you to see this pattern of James having nothing to do with Jesus, and now Jesus has stepped into his life. See, Jesus said over and over, I have come to seek and save the lost. I have not come for the healthy, I have come for the sick. He says, I'll leave the 99 sheep and go after the one. Jesus even does it with his own family. That's powerful. He could have absolutely have said, James, you're dead to me, buddy. Brothers, dead to me. Sisters, dead to me. You had every chance in life and you denied me. Done. Written that family off. And that is not what he does. Jesus pursues his own brothers pursues his sisters, walks into their life and completely changes them. In fact, so much so, did you know two books of the Bible in the New Testament are written by Jesus' brothers? James and Jude. See, Jude is one of his brothers. And Jude was another. So so you have two authors of the Bible that were literally his brothers. I just think that's powerful. And so what's the message for us in all of this? Literally nobody is too far for Jesus to step into and save their life. You may say, look, I have nothing to do with Jesus. I I can't believe I'm even sitting in here today. I'm so far apart. I am too far gone. You are not. If Jesus will come in and he will radically change his own brother who denied him and left him to die alone and come intently to change his life, he can change your life too. And he will change your life. There is nobody so far away that is beyond the means and the measures and the grace of God. Nobody. The question is, do you believe that for yourself? The question is, will you say, I can trust in that and I will lean into Jesus? I feel like everything inside of me is saying, absolutely not, but God, I'm going to trust you. That's the question that you have to ask for yourself. So then the next question is, we look at James, what happens to him? He has this encounter with Jesus. What happens? Well, I'll tell you what happens some pretty amazing things happen. If you go look in Acts, and I'm actually going to take a peek at this, we see James show up. It's not just that Jesus appeared into James's life. Something happens with James. So at the very beginning of Acts, if you read the first few verses, Jesus, after he is risen from the dead, he spends 40 days with his disciples. So it says that he's appearing to them, and he's teaching them, and he's, like, they're all of a sudden, the, the heavens have opened, they fully understand what Jesus was all about. 40 days before he ra- he, he's risen. 40 days. Now what happens later? Look with me in verse 12 of Acts 1. Then they, meaning all of the disciples and everyone's with them, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they enter, they went to the upper room where they were staying. And then it gives the list of all the people are staying. It's all 11 apostles, all 11. We're not counting Judas Iscariot the 12th because he had killed himself. So all 11 apostles are named. They're all there. And all those with one accord, verse 14, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So within 40, let me me rephrase this. Within 40 days, the brothers and sisters that have nothing to do with Jesus, now they're in the upper room. Now they're with everyone else. Jesus didn't just reach into only James's life. Jesus reached into his family's life. He transformed his own family's life. That's a powerful statement. Jesus can transform your family's life as well. You may be sitting here today being like, there's no chance for my family. What they've done to me is inexcusable. And that is true. That may be true. But that doesn't mean that Jesus can't transform them. Jesus is in the habit of, Jesus is able to, and he loves to transform families for his good. So now here is James, who is now in the upper room. He's with Jesus when all this happens, and his life is completely changed. Let's fast forward even a little bit more. Go circle later, Acts chapter 15. 15 years from now, roughly. Something like that, maybe 20. Now we see James pictured again. This time he is what I would call the pastor of the church in Jerusalem the very first church ever. And and Paul is coming back from a missionary journey. And God is doing all of this powerful work in the the lives of foreigners. We call them them Gentiles, people that are not Jewish people, not live the Jewish life. And they see all these people starting to say, we're following Jesus, we're giving our life for Jesus. 
Paul comes back, and they're trying to rectify this. How do we make this work? Are you kidding me? Are you telling me that Jesus is changing the lives of non-Jewish people too? And all of a sudden, it, it enlightens them that Jesus is for all tribes, all tongues, all people, all nation, nationalities, all colors. Jesus has wide open arms for the nations. And they come in, and Paul, for the first time, is trying to rectify this. So they bring this back to the church council in Jerusalem. And who is the one that speaks up? James. And what does James say? It is right that we welcome these people in. James' arms are as wide as Jesus's because he sees what Jesus is doing. He sees how their lives have been changed. He's like, come on in, baby. We got room for you too. That's the life of James. That's how much God has changed him. He turns out to be not just the leader of the church in Jerusalem, not just the first pastor ever. He turns out to be this guy that is wise, that is loving, that is open, that is caring. He tends to be blunt. He tends to be short with his words, not flowery like Paul, but he is absolutely a pastor through and through. He never leaves Jerusalem, at least not for any long period of time. He's not an apostle going out and preaching to the lost nations. He's staying in Jerusalem, being a pastor among his people. That's the kind of guy he is. So now we can finally go into the first verse, and we'll be very quick with it. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. So we close with this. Here comes James walking into the scenes. And what does he say? James, a servant of God, not, and the Lord Jesus Christ, not brother. See, if I'm writing this, I'd be like, hey, you know who I am? I'm James. You know who my brother is? Jesus? Y'all better be listening to me now, all right? That's what I would be saying. He doesn't do that. He takes the humble route. He's just like, I'm just a servant of him. That's all I am, just a servant. And then later in James, he keeps calling everyone else that he's writing to his brothers. It's this idea of saying, if I really am his brother, I don't even need to say it. But y'all are my brothers, which makes you brothers of Jesus. And that's the humility that just shines through James. That's the kind of guy he is. Wouldn't you know it, James has 108 verses. 54 of them are commands. 50, or sorry, 50, 59 are commands. Meaning 54% of every part of James is a command for us to follow a thing for us to do, a way to think. James is rife with how do we live in Jesus' kingdom. And wouldn't you also know it, James was the very first book ever written in the New Testament. It came out before the Gospels. It came out before Paul's epistles. So here's James, the pastor of the first church, thinking, how do I give guidance to people to live a life in, in God's kingdom? That's the book of James. It's a book of wisdom literature. That's why it is, is, exists the way it is. And so when you read James this week, that's what I want you to do. Look at it through that lens. Jesus, what would you teach me? If I moved to a new country, wouldn't it make sense that I want to know the laws? I want to know the culture. I want to know the people so that I don't get on the wrong side of that. That's what Jesus is saying. You're now in my kingdom. And you need to learn my culture and my rules and the way we all live. That's what James is all about for us. And so I want to I kind of close with this. One thing you will see in James, you will see that James gives us these commands. And they, James can give us these commands because Jesus has lived these commands. If you think about a rope for a minute, I can put a rope out, and it's absolutely worthless if I try to push it. It just goes limp every time. If I take a rope and I pull that rope, I can move a boat that's the idea. Jesus is saying, I have walked through this life. In the next few verses we're going to unpack next week, this idea of count it joy when you go through sufferings and trials. Jesus is saying, I've gone through sufferings and trials. I have died for you. And so Jesus is saying, I have the rope and I am pulling you towards me. You know what your job is to do? To grab that rope. In faith, jump in, grab the rope that Jesus is pulling you and let you go through. Because the reality is, if you take the book of James, you're like, I am going to live these commands just like the Sermon on the Mount, you'll fail. You'll always fail. If you look at James like, Jesus, how did you go through this? Jesus, how did you do this? And then I say, Jesus, how do I follow you in this? You'll find success. That's the only way. And that's why James came about. You know, I love to bike. I'm not one of those guys that, like, rides bikes with, like, you know, tons of people. I just go by myself or with my kids. We do these long, like, 150-mile bike trails over, over um, you know, three or four days. 
and I also like doing local trails. This is the Starkey Wilderness Preserve. It's up in kind of close to Newport Ritchie. It's a beautiful trail. It's about seven and a half miles in and back, so 14, 15 miles. If you've never done it, I highly recommend it. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's beautiful. Uh, I took my kids. You can actually see Nolan on the very far right over there. We're going down this trail, and as we're going down the trail, I noticed something. I, my nose started to smell some smoke, and I'm like, that's weird. What's going on here? And we go a little further, and then I notice that uh, the, the, the actual forest had been burned down. I couldn't help but stop, get off my bike, and take pictures. There's the first picture of just a husk of a tree completely burnt out. Here's the second one of even worse. Just sort of you feel alone. You feel desolate. You feel it's sad. Like seeing a forest fire just burn everything out is terrible. Well, I go a little further, and I notice something. I notice that the forest is starting to come back to life. The fire didn't actually kill it. I learned that this was a prescribed burn, that what they do in forest is that they intentionally burn them down because it's actually healthy for the forest. It clears out the brush and it lets the forest grow healthy. It also stops a worse forest fire from coming in the future. It's a really important part of forest health. And I think the book of James is teaching us the same thing. Everything about this is Jesus saying, come with me, come through the trials, come through the pain. I might burn your forest down spiritually, only to raise it back up, only to raise you back up. And if you look at the inner workings of the universe, it is this way. You look at a seed I planted in the ground, it dies, it grows to be a tree taller than this roof. I look at winter, desolate and cold, turning to spring, birds coming out, everything growing. It's wonderful. We look at stars, they go supernova and explode with power we can't imagine. And then all of that material goes through the universe, goes through the galaxy and forms new stars. It's like Jesus is saying, death leads to life. And if you'll trust me in that and you're willing to die to yourself and follow me, that's where you'll find life. And that's what the book of James is all about. But first we must test ourselves. Where do we stand in Jesus's kingdom? The book of James will give us what we need to know. Do we stack up? Do we meet his righteous commands? If we look at this and we say, I don't meet them, your job is to trust Jesus. You have one command, flee to Jesus. Pray to Jesus, change my life, I will live for you. If you look at this, you're like, I got some weak areas, some things I can improve on. Just know that's what the book of James is about, helping you grow and change and become more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this awesome time to come before your word. Thank you for James. Thank you for who he is. Thank you for what you've taught us in your word. Help us to be doers of the word, not just hearers, as James said. And anyone that's listening and hearing this today and feel like, God, that's me. I, I need that life change, Lord. They just, all they need to do is reach out to you, to cry out to you, to ask you to change their lives. Lord, would you do that? Lord, would you speak through us? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.